we're talking about blockchain gaming. I'm Sarah McKenna, I'm the co-founder of Alien Worlds. We're an NFT and DAO play to earn metaverse, and we're the number two by users in the world, the number two blockchain game by users, and you can see that data at dapradar.com. Okay, so today we'll co cover a number of foundational um, concepts and topics that I think will lead to an understanding of um, how blockchain technology underpinning gaming in the metaverse supports communities and, and community growth and player growth. Okay, so today we'll cover what is a metaverse? What's the relationship between games and the metaverse? What's play to earn gaming? How does, does that have to be built on a blockchain? Um, is play to earn gaming fun? Sometimes they don't feel like real games, perhaps. What's the connection between Web 2, Web 3, the metaverse and gaming? What's the role of fungible tokens, NFTs, DAOs? And we'll conclude with some thoughts on why DAOs are the next iteration in blockchain gaming after NFTs. Okay, so I won't belabor this slide. This is um, on our website. This represents the tokenomics of the Alien Worlds metaverse. You can just get a sense here that this is how Trillium, our fungible token, flows through the smart contracts and accounts of the metaverse. I think important perhaps to notice um, inflation there, the, the sort of central bubble. Um, this is what drives the play to earn mechanism. It gets allocated through to the planets, the planet DAOs, which are competing against each other for inflation, for play to earn rewards every day. And also the land owners. Land is an NFT in our metaverse. And you can take a look at this in more detail if you'd like. Here we have all of the smart contracts and accounts um, that make up the gaming functionality. Um, so you can see, for example, at the bottom that players are able to vote um, for using smart contracts for the DAO custodians. Each of the planets has an account. There's a relationship between the Federation, which is um, where the Trillium originates, to each of the DAOs and so on. So this is also within our technical blueprint um, on the website, and uh, this describes the smart contract um, architecture um, and, and the accounts and various interrelationships between the accounts on chain. Okay, so the first foundational piece of the puzzle that we'll try and put in place um, is what is a metaverse? And this is important because a metaverse is what drives, the metaverse is, is the platform within which the other functionality is happening, the, the games and the other commercial activity and so on is occurring. Okay, so what's a metaverse? A metaverse is uh, a digital space where peer-to-peer -peer interactions happen within a single environment. Okay, so let's take each of those in turn. So digital space, I think fairly obvious um, that the metaverse is not the physical universe, the physical environment, but a, a meta construction of that in the di digital realm. Peer-to-peer, -peer, so within a metaverse, each of the um, participants can interact with each other bilaterally without having to go through a central um, point of control or uh, the platform owner. This is a consequence of the fact that participants in the metaverse own the system. They own it because they own the tokens that make up the system and also because the other flows within the metaverse are um, sort of prescribed according to, to rules that have been laid down. So there isn't, um, the, all of the participants are on an equal footing. They might not all have an equal size in terms of their economic stake in the system or, you know, their, their power within the system as measured by token ownership, but they all are on an equal footing. And this is, of course, in contradistinction to Web2 platforms um, where the participants are not co-owners of the system, right? The, the platform owner owns the system and gets to, to set the rules and most often to, to monetize that position. So the implication of the fact that peer -to -peer, a peer-to-peer -peer nature is, is foundational to the metaverse is, is then the fact that a blockchain construction is foundational to being a metaverse. Um, without a blockchain construction, it's not really possible to to make those peer-to-peer -peer actions and transactions possible. And so that is really a prerequisite to being a metaverse, which means that Facebook's meta is not a metaverse. It's just a rich content sharing platform like Facebook. 
Um, so metaverse is a digital space where peer-to-peer -peer interac interactions happen within a single environment. So single environment, I think, you know, that that's also perhaps an intuitive um, part of the definition. Um, it's a, it must be a persistent place where people are gathering, people are going to do something. Now, does that single environment need to be built out in 3D, AR, VR? No, um, that's the user interface layer. Um, and of course it changes over time as technology evolves, but the actual underlying functionality is the blockchain construction. Okay, so what's the relationship then between games and the metaverse? So we're here at a gaming conference, why are we talking about the metaverse? Because games have been a very strong initial application running on metaverse platforms and, you know, the big metaverses today are, you know, you could also describe them as gaming platforms. Um, but it's also true to say that you could describe them in other ways too, and that would be accurate. So for example, work is happening in the metaverse and in play to earn gaming environments that are metaverses. Um, commerce is happening. People are selling things to each other. They're offering services to each other for profit. Um, it's a very natural environment for esports to occur, right? So, you know, competitive gaming by, by groups of people. And of course, content creation is happening in the metaverse. So, you know, within the Alien Worlds metaverse, we have artists creating NFTs, musicians, um, writers extending the lore. Uh, now that content part is actually pretty much what Web2 is. And it's a consequence of the decentralized construction of blockchain metaverses that you can have, and therefore the shared ownership of those systems, that you have commerce and work, for example, being such important components of what happens in a metaverse. Because only when people are co-owners of the system do they really take that kind of um, entrepreneurial position within it and, and invest their time and take risk and so on in order then to participate you know, as a co-owner and as a seller of services or an entrepreneur. Okay. So what's play to earn gaming? Does it have to be built on a blockchain? Okay, so play to earn gaming, of course, um, revolves around players earning things of value. But the question is, what value does the user ascribe to the things that they're earning? If the thing that they're earning exists within, you know, a single walled garden, a single application, a single game, then of course users know that they're capacity to really own that thing is a little bit limited or is always going to be dependent on that publisher. And so when, when gamers are earning things that, that they know to be theirs, they place a lot more value in that and that then becomes a much stronger motivating force, both to their playing to earn, but also then how they see their role within the, the system because they see themselves as a real owner. So the problem is that the things that players are earning have to have value in a trustless way, right? A way that doesn't rely on the user having trust in the platform. And of course, blockchain systems have trustlessness at their core. That's, that's why they're built in a decentralized way. So when a system is really decentralized, then it's not possible to bring it down just by targeting, you know, a couple of the participants. It, it, a really decentralized system is extremely secure and robust. And so I think whether they know it or not, that's why people are ascribing um, you know, value in blockchain assets because they're being supported by a very decentralized construction underneath that through the blockchains that those applications are running on. Okay, so of course, you know, you could build a play turn system around fiat currency too, right? Um, and I would argue that to an extent that's what, um, you know, e certain esports systems have done where, um, you know, the, the very best players are able to earn a brilliant living in fiat currency from what they're doing. So fiat currency is also a completely legitimate um, way to, to um, incentivize players, possibly not very scalable. Um, and of course, over time, you know, query whether inflation and things like Justin Trudeau turning off the bank accounts of people he disagrees with, people who disagree with him, um, whether that's kind of undermining, you know, the, the value of the fiat system in general. So, you know, the blockchain answer to that is that the assets that people earn in play turn systems are on chain immutably theirs and trustless. Okay, so one of the reasons why play to earn systems are built on chain is, is because of that feature. The other is what's on this slide here. Um, 
This is again in our technical blueprint, so you can take a look at this in more detail. This shows um, the various accounts and assets that are residing on different chains and in the alien world's metaverse and our construction. And I think what's important is to notice that outer ring there, so where you see external application, external application. So what that's describing is that, you know, other people can build applications, functionality that plugs in through APIs to your gaming smart contracts if they are built on chain, on public blockchains. And what's interesting, of course, is that those external applications can be built by anyone, but also actually the APIs and the other kind of interfaces into the smart contracts can be built by other parties than, than the creators of the smart contracts. And that's really significant because it means that you get all of your community or the, the parts of the community that are technically minded enough, right? So technical teams, often from other projects who are able to come in and either build APIs or once the APIs are built, build the applications that then extend the game functionality, extend the metaverse outward. And, you know, as those of you in the audience who, you know, are building games across lots of different types of platforms know it takes time to do that, right, as a singular team. Uh, whereas when you can unleash this, the power of much more of your community, all of the sort of technical um, parts of the community or attract those into your ecosystem, and then they start building stuff out, you just get a richness that you never could have achieved yourself. So, you know, stuff in different languages, different user interfaces, functionality that you just never would have realized that users wanted can be built out by other teams than, than you, and that's super powerful. And I think this slide really just summing that up, but perhaps one of the um, interesting or, you know, things to draw out here is the fact that user interfaces can be built by others. So, you know, that's um, significant. You know, the decentralized construction of a metaverse means that the, the gaming logic is running on a blockchain, but the interfaces in can be built by, by anyone. Okay, is play to earn gaming fun? It doesn't feel like a real game. So yes, I mean, the first thing I would say is that uh, the games have to be fun. Um, all activity in the metaverse should have intrinsic value. Um, and in our case, uh, we have NFTs with lots of attributes that have been extremely well thought through, a lot of richness, uh, variation between the NFTs themselves across different series and how they interact when using them um, for mining or for missions or for other functionality that we've built out. Um, you know, that's, there's, there's also parts of the metaverse that, that require people to cooperate. So the DAO, um, you know, taking over a DAO requires a lot of coordination and competition between the DAOs and collaboration on each of the DAOs. So this is fun. You know, this is um, this is a level of engagement that that is really rewarding. But I would say that, yes, I do understand why this issue comes up, right? Why people say, but is it really a game? Because, you know, if it weren't for the play to earn component, th the actual pure fun of it might be if you look at it in a narrow sense, might not really sustain people's interest. So let's not look at it in the narrow, through a narrow lens, because I don't think that's the lens that users are looking at it through. So we've already built up some foundational concepts by now of, you know, the fact that a metaverse involves, you know, these peer-to-peer -peer interactions. It's built on a blockchain. Users have a trustless ability to see that their assets really belong to them. What then does that mean? We've, we've kind of, we've built that up to the point where we can see that people are co-owners of the system, right? Along with the, the creators of the game. What does that mean then if they're co-owners of a game? Well, it means that this entrepreneurial spirit that they're bringing, plus the actual gameplay itself, is merging these concepts of work and leisure. And I think we can already see um, that that's occurring, you know, that, it's hard to tell sometimes whether something is play or is an enterprise. And the, the lines between those two things are getting a little bit blurred, as actually are a number of these um, sort of dualities in the metaverse. So, you know, the producer and consumer getting blurred, owner and participant getting blurred, enterprise and play also getting, you know, becoming closer together in the metaverse context. So, you know, 
then we ask the question, so we're asking the question, is it, are these games fun? And I would say, well, let's, you know, if these games represent a co-melding of, of work and leisure, you know, why do we play games at all? It's to experience feelings that we kind of wish we could experience in the real world, right? So feelings of success, dominance, um, mastery, um, collaboration, competition, you know, all of that drive that we have to compete and win and the feelings that we get from that are why we play games. Well, when you pull out a little bit and you look at people's involvement in these play turn metaverses, it's giving them all of those feelings, right? Because they're having to coordinate between each other to create a proposition of value, whether it's taking over a DAO or creating a land collective that issues NFTs. They're having to figure out which part of the metaverse they want to be involved with. They're going to a Twitch stream. They're connecting with other people through Telegram and Discord. They're creating their own Telegram and Discord channels. They're making money, you know, not just through the game, but also through these other services that they're offering. That leads to feelings of, you know, challenge and overcoming that challenge and success and mastery and collaboration and all those things. So I would actually say that in the same way as work is not in itself fun, right? The specific tasks that we do at work are often not fun. The kind of broader place that work has in our life is really satisfying. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't do it most of the time, right? It's challenge and then get gaining mastery and so on. So just like work in a narrow context isn't fun, but if you pull it out, it kind of is. So to, you know, gaming in the metaverse is fun on different levels and clearly users are getting a huge amount out of the experience and it goes beyond the financial rewards it goes it speaks to the reasons why we why we game in the first place and the feelings that it gives us okay what's the connection between web 2 web 3 the metaverse and gaming big questions we'll take a stab at these and um go through them you know a little bit quickly but so let's look at this slide on the on the left hand side we have a historical model of web you know, web 1.0 model, even just a sort of classical economic model where we have, you know, producers and consumers, producers produce, consumers consume what's being produced by the producers and they pay for it, right? Unidimensional two-way two relationship. Web 2 iteration of that business model, which was at the time pretty, you know, revolutionary, was that consumers, by using those platforms that the producers were creating, were giving their data to those platforms and the platforms were monetizing that. And so they, again, there was a, a, just a two-way relationship between a producer and a consumer. And I think there was some degree of triangulation happening there where you had like influencers, kind of super participants who did manage to monetize a position because they were influential over other participants in the system. But those influencers weren't owners of the system. They were just managing to monetize a position within that. And that's, and they were doing it again through content. That whole paradigm there relies on content. So, you know, influencers were just creating better content than other people and eventually getting paid for that and, and having to hustle quite a bit to get to that point anyway. Then on the right-hand side of this slide, we see this Web3 model, um, a decentralized model. So Web3, a concept that is essentially a you know blockchain or a decentralized concept. The term was coined by Gavin Wood, one of the uh, co-founders of Ethereum. And it essentially describes, you know, the iteration of the web in which participants are co-owners. And this is made possible by blockchain constructions. And what a revolution in business models happens when that transition happens, and it's happening right now. So we can see here, here's an example of, you know, a type of, um, construction that, that, that can exist within a Web3 decentralized model, and that's a DAO, and we'll come to that a little bit more later. This is just one example of how people can get together. It's formalized through smart contracts. And here what we're showing is a company or a brand's place within a DAO, and you can see that everyone, like I was saying at the beginning, is on the same footing. Now, in this case, this company owns you know, that proportion of the tokens of the DAO, so they have that kind of stake, but they have the same um, rights as everybody else in the DAO. What that means is that you know, they are in a relationship with their consumers. Their consumers can vote for what they think, you know, they want as a next iteration of the product that the company is producing. Um, companies can test ideas. Um, users can actually, you know, become part of the, the direction of, of the company in that case. And also the company can, you know, begin to interact with, with their users in a different way. 
DAOs don't have to involve companies or brands. It can just be groups of people. Um, but again, it's people coming together in a fully circular way in which nobody has a preferred place versus anybody else. They might own more of the tokens of the DAO, which gives them more power, but it doesn't give them a preferred place. And so in that fully circular model, uh, transformational new business models um, happen. And there's also the potential for you know, value capture around those new business models that um, represents an entirely new line of business. Okay, what's the role of fungible tokens, NFTs, and DAOs? So fungible tokens, NFTs, and DAOs all are on-chain things and they all represent distinct aspects of a system. One of the things that's important to understand about each of those is that they either are or have a token. So fungible tokens are tokens. They represent within a system power, stake, reward, value, right? Because you can either own more or less of it, basically. NFTs represent unique objects and they're tokens too, non-fungible tokens. Tokens just like fungible tokens, except they're in specific series and so they can naturally represent unique objects. And DAOs have a token at the heart of them. They are built around a token, a fungible token. They can hold NFTs in their, in their DAO accounts. And they represent groups of people or teams. Okay, so we have fungible tokens representing kind of value, power within a system. NFTs representing unique objects and DAOs representing people or teams. Each of them extremely significant concepts to be able to represent on chain. Okay, and now let's talk a little bit about why I think DAOs are the next NFTs in the sense that if 2021 was the year of the NFT, uh, 2022 will be the year of the DAO, both within you know, blockchain gaming, society as a whole, um, and, and the metaverse. Okay, so let me just baseline for one second on uh, what a DAO is. A DAO is a blockchain account, a series of multi-signatory permissions on that account that governs how tokens can be transacted out of the account, and electoral mechanics that um, grant various blockchain accounts those multi-signatory powers. In our case in Alien Worlds, each of our six planets is a DAO, and the way that those are initially configured are to have five custodians each period, and, and a period is one week, so every week we have a, a new set of custodians. Uh, or at least a new tally of the of the leading custodians. They might be the same week on week. Um, and uh, users can vote for three custodians in each period. So they can vote, so there are five that get elected and they can vote for three. And all of those parameters have been thought through um, as a consequence of our experience uh, building DAOs for a number of years. Um, but they can be configured and, and most of them are calibrated to maximize security. Um, to maximize the security for the participants of the system. So for example, the periodicity of elections, if you have shorter elections, like for example, every half hour, then if a custodian board seemed primed to approve a resolution that was entirely self-seeking for that custodian board, the users would have time to organize, to vote those custodians out before they were, potentially before they were able to make that transfer out of the DAO's account. But very short period of city of elections is a little bit more unwieldy to manage. I mean, it is normally the case that the same custodians are at the top period on period, although you can get like the bottom custodians, you know, coming out of the, um, of the top ranking, for example. So it's a little bit more at a human level, it's a bit harder for people to manage if the period of city of elections is, is shorter, but from a sort of purely um, blockchain security perspective, you would have very short elections. So each of those parameters has been thought through the number of, um, of custodians that people can vote for in relation to the number that there are each week. All of that is, is thought through and, you know, discussions can be had about the sort of pros and cons of calibrating them in each way. Um, the other thing I think it's important to mention is stake-weighted voting within this system. So the number of the DAO's tokens that you have in your account when you're voting is the power that you're voting with. Um, stake weighted voting and this is really significant in blockchain systems because in order to secure them you need people staking into them and so um, a sort of understaked DAO is extremely easy to take over and is insecure so you're trying to promote people staking into the DAO so that it will be a robust um, place for people to invest their time and actually grow, grow um, the DAO and work towards its goals. 
Worker proposal is often a um, key feature of a DAO. Um, so this is where the custodians, there's a specific system where people can propose work into the DAO and the custodians can approve it and people get paid and this is how the DAO can kind of pursue its whatever end it, it has, its goals. Okay, so that's what a DAO is. It's a blockchain account, a series of multi-sig permissions and governance election mechanics on that. Um, and this is all happening on chain. It's all trustless, mutable, and transparent. Okay, so a, block, a DAO is a blockchain account with a token, right? What then becomes possible, right? And it's a group, it represents a group of people. Well, you can see that the DAO then becomes an object that can move around the metaverse. The, you know, it, it has agency, it can do things, it can airdrop its tokens to other DAOs, it can receive tokens into its treasury from other DAOs. So you can have, you know, a, a cooperative relationship between DAOs in which they've each kind of swapped some of their tokens. You could have a competitive relationship between DAOs in which the users of one DAO coordinate to try and take over another DAO within a specific period, which means, you know, staking tokens into that DAO or acquiring that DAO's tokens. And um, you can have competition that, or, sorry, collaboration that doesn't necessarily revolve around the token, you know, just co-marketing or co-branding between those groups of people. And oftentimes, you know, that the metaverse is that singular um, environment. Oftentimes people will be, you know, a member of multiple DAOs. Um, you know, really interesting ways that new communities can, can form and coalesce within a metaverse like this, a singular digital space like this. So they come in, form a DAO, maybe airdrop their tokens to other established DAOs or other people in the, in the metaverse to kind of announce their arrival, right? Um, you can have a, a community doing that to new members or to other DAOs. And also recall uh, also that NFTs are part of the tokens that can be transacted in this way. So a DAO can hold NFTs, can create NFTs, can send NFTs around. Um, and all of this is how, you know, the, the DAO creates value, furthers its ends, rewards its members, tracks its members. You can track, for example, reputational system, a rep reputation within a system through um, the DAOs and NFTs. Um, this is an important topic within blockchain systems in general is reputation. So um, a blockchain account doesn't have a natural identity, but it can build up reputation over time. And one of the ways it can do that is, for example, by earning badges or NFTs. So this gives you a glimpse, you know, that was a lot of information, but it gives you a taste of, you know, in this peer-to-peer -peer singular economy that's built by, you know, a blockchain metaverse in which there, we have fungible tokens, NFTs and DAOs, what becomes possible a ton of new transactional flows, ways of people interacting, uh, and, a, and a lot of new business models. Okay, so our perspective at Alien Worlds is that the DAO is a fundamental game object at scale. Okay, so, you know, if we track the progression um, of gaming from pay to play to free to play, and then the advent of blockchain gaming, which in itself probably seems like pretty recent, um, but within that, you know, there are um, there is uh, progression happening. So in that first iteration of the, of, you know, successful play to earn games like Axie Infinity Sandbox, we had fungible tokens and NFTs um, and people were able to, you know, use the NFTs as part of gameplay. And now in this next iteration of the model that Alien Worlds is, is spearheading as the, as the second largest uh, blockchain game in the world by users. You can see that on DAP Radar. Uh, what we're Pioneering is fungible tokens, NFTs, but also DAOs as competitive gaming objects. So you might hear quite a bit about DAOs in relation to blockchain projects, but just be aware that in general, that normally describes part of the project's token being governed by a DAO. In our case, what we're describing is DAOs as teams within the system, DAOs as competitive units that can self-organize, that are highly dynamic, that have legacy systems built within them, that are on-chain, um, and that I think represent really the next, um, the next revolution in blockchain play to earn gaming, which is playing to earn as a team. And just finally, those of you that are interested, uh, why do we care so much about DAOs here at Alien Worlds? We've been building them for a number of years, um, even back when we called them DAX. Um, and we tried a number of ways of doing that until we sort of hit upon this, this idea to build DAOs and NFTs into a gaming environment as part of a metaverse um, and, uh, and managed to achieve you know, great scale through that. So hope that presentation helped to explain how 
you know, blockchain, a blockchain construction and building up into a metaverse leads to users having co-ownership of the system and being able to build both technically, but also from a community perspective into that system um, and how that builds great communities and ultimately products with a lot of scale. Thanks very much.